We want to welcome you to the Garrett Student Center tonight for this fine public display of love and affection for Harriet and Dero Downing. And I would like to call on Dr. Wilbur Jones at this time for the invocation. Dr. Jones. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather here this evening in special recognition and honor of our retiring university president, we pause to express our thanks for D. Rowe and Harriet Downing and for their many contributions and untiring efforts for this university. We're thankful for the inspiring example and the great leadership that he has shown in his professional life, in his family life, and in his Christian life. We are mindful of and indeed grateful for Dr. Downing's dedication to service, for his courage and patience in facing issues, for his sensitivity to the counsel of others while being firm in principle, for his awareness of the theoretical while alert to the practical, for his devotion to and love for Western, for his faith in God, and for his example in demonstrating that the Spirit does truly make the master. Father, we invoke your continued blessings on this institution as it seeks new leadership. And we pray for blessings of good health, peace, and happiness on Mr. and Mrs. Downing and their family. May your blessings be on this gathering. Bless the food that we're receiving to the nourishment of our bodies and the fellowship of the evening to the nourishment of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Wilbur. I had a few nice words I wanted to say about Dero, but all I can say after that lovely prayer is amen. Lon, uh, where's Lon Slaughter? Just want to take just a minute to thank Lon Slaughter and his staff for this outstanding job they've done on this banquet. Lon always does a, a great job, and that's uh, typical of a class of 36 from Bowling Green High. <laughs> I would like at this time to introduce the guest at the head table who will not have a part on our program. And I would ask that they stand and you hold your applause until they have all been introduced. On my left is Mrs. Julian Goodman, Betty. My wife uh, and the better part of the Smith family, Noreen. Virginia Earl Pearson. Let's give all these people a round of applause. It's certainly a pleasure tonight to have a good part of the Downing family here, and there are some that deserve some special recognition. And I would uh, ask that the, as I call their name, the Downing children and uh, Harriet's mother to stand, and I would again ask that you hold your applause until uh, they've all been introduced. We have uh, Catherine and Evelyn Smith and their three children, Eddie, Donald, and George Ann. We have Dee Downing from Arkansas, and unfortunately his wife and two children couldn't come, but we're glad to have you here, Dee. Ann and, and uh, Ray Patterson. Elizabeth Downing. Alex Downing, the tennis star. <laughs> and Mrs. Yarnell, Harriet's mother. Let's give these people five minutes. There's another group here tonight that I don't want to call each of their names. If they did, we'd be here till sometime after midnight. <laughs> but there's a fine show of family ties here tonight from the Goodman and Downing uh, families across Barron County, Fountain Run, New York City, you name it, and they've got it. And I understand they're 64 strong here, and I wish they'd all stand and let us recognize them. There are several people who helped plan this banquet that I would like to take special uh, thanks for. That's uh, D. Gibson, Ray Lazarus, Paul Cook, Bone Green Warren County Chamber of Commerce, and there were many others that, that participated in the program and had the idea 
uh, that we should honor uh, Harriet and Dero, and it's certainly appropriate that we do it tonight. In planning a group like this or a banquet like this, it's uh, sometimes difficult to come up with who is going to make the principal speech and what they're going to have to say. But when we looked over all of the people that had touched Harriet and Dero, and certainly Western, two names came out in focus. And it's certainly my pleasure tonight to introduce these two fine speakers. I think it's rather ironic that Barron County, Kentucky, has had national recognition with people who have been born in Glasgow and Barron County and moved on to higher endeavors elsewhere. And these two gentlemen tonight are examples of that fine heritage. The first speaker tonight certainly needs no introduction to us. General Russell Doherty, who graduated from high school in Barron County, is a graduate of Western Kentucky University, the University of Louisville, the National War College. General Doherty started his career in the service in the 123rd uh, Cavalry over in Barron County, I believe. Is that right, Russ? He has served continuously since 1943 in the U.S. Air Force. His last assignment was Commander-in-Chief of SAC Air Force in Omaha, Nebraska, and he served in this capacity in a very distinguished manner. I think perhaps the highest compliment that could be said to Russ is that he is a warm and compassionate leader who has served his country well. It is now my pleasure to introduce General Russell Darty. Thank you, Herb. Here in this magnificent hall of our great university, we, the friends, the relatives, the colleagues, the teachers, the students, the administrators, the executives, and the classmates have gathered from throughout our state and throughout our nation to pay tribute and to express our appreciation to D. Rowe Downing and to his lovely wife, Harriet, the presidential couple of our beloved university. Oliver Wendell Holmes observed once that every time he got back to Boston, it took him several days to realize that the reference around town to the president had nothing to do with that minor official in Washington. It was to the president of Harvard. And so it is here in Southern Kentucky that the president and his lady is recognized by all of us as a reference to the Downings. And how privileged I am to be here tonight, a part of, of this family of friends and admirers, and to be the spokesman from among the circle of articulate friends of D. Rowe and Harriet's, chosen to express to them our gratitude for their selfless devotion to our alma mater and to the youth of our nation. D. Rowe's character and his achievements have, to some degree, uh, touched the lives and hearts of every one of us. And it's a rare honor that's mine tonight to bear witness to the quality of this man and his life's mate, this humble, talented son of Kentucky. As he crosses the threshold of his final year, his sabbatical year as our president. Would that Dr. Cherry, Dr. Garrett, and Dr. Kelly Thompson were here with us tonight to share in this special occasion and to join us in the deserved praise of their worthy successor. For all of us who have been the beneficiaries of their dreams and their inspired leadership are confident that these distinguished predecessors of D. Rowe Downing would echo our tribute and our gratitude for his decade of leadership and for his loyalty to the spirit and to the substance of Western. I'll try to speak for them, for us, for all of you, for the alumni, the students, and the friends uh, of those we honor tonight, but there's so much that we could say. So let me start at the beginning and go through the ABCs as I see it. The D. Rowe Downing that we know is not an affluent man in a worldly sense of worldly possessions, for he's the president of our university. But he's a man of ability and action, and he's a balanced man, doing what he could with what he has in the place where he is and doing it well. He's a good citizen. Alexei de Tocqueville said once that the health of a democratic society 
may be measured by the quality of the functions performed by its citizens. And certainly Dero Downing has discharged his duty as a citizen of quality to a degree unexcelled by any of his fellow citizens. He's a Christian man, a practitioner of the art of overcoming evil with good. He's a civilized man, equally skilled in the art of using persuasion rather than force. He's a cultured, courageous man. And if Hemingway was right in describing courage as the ability to display grace under pressure, then D. Rowe Downing is courageous beyond all expectation. He's a conservative man in its finest sense, constantly bringing to bear his wisdom, his experienced and his finely tuned sense of right and wrong on the preservation by our society of those things worth preserving and ridding our society of those things that erode and destroy it. He's a man of quiet but obvious dignity, with dignity of person and dignity of performance in both the grandest and the most menial of tasks. And obviously he is an experienced and educated man, not merely experienced and educated in theories and in classes and classics and facts, but with a rich understanding of basic values, essential personal disciplines, and the value of an open, inquiring mind. He has been an exceptional president of our college. <clears throat> he has never let our school, our college, deserve the cynical definition of John Ciardi that a university is what a college becomes when the faculty loses interest in the students. There is no attribute more evident in D. Rowe Downing than in his general, gen genuine friendliness. Friendship for all, regardless of station or petition. His friendly manner to all is his hallmark. And he's a family man. To, to emulate and to admire, witness this wholesome family here in our midst tonight. What better lengthening shadow than the reach of this grand couple through three generations and more. And Dero is unquestionably a good man without peer. Good in all his motivation, his selfless devoted actions, his manifest accomplishments. As I reflected on his goodness, I was pointedly reminded of just how much his life's work as a teacher fulfills the wise philosophy of Maria Montessori when she said that the task of an educator lies in seeing that our youth do not confound good with mo immobility and evil with activity. Yes, in my view, D. Rowe qualifies as a great man. And I must ask you, Mrs. Yarnell, if it's true that behind every great man there stands a completely surprised mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Dero Downing's greatness to me uh, is evident not merely because he's strong, but because of the wise, compassionate youth, a uh, use he makes of his strength in all his endeavors. To paraphrase John Gardner, Dero has not only done extraordinary things well, he has done ordinary things extraordinarily well. And he's a happy man. He has met life's test of doing what he likes and liking what he does with a wonderful family who supports and shares his interests completely. And he's an honorable man whose honor does not consist of the honors he possesses, but in deserving every one of them. Also, he is a humble man. I can hear him saying of his presidency, as Pope John XXIII said of his papal role, anybody can be the president of Western Kentucky University for 10 years, and the proof of this is that I have done so. <laughs> He's a man of intelligence, ideals, and ideas. Sterling ideals that guide him and inspire others. Intelligent ideas whose time has come 
and whose thrust has carried our university to the heights, but kept its feet firmly and securely planted on solid ground. D. Downing is a man of rare judgment and common sense, knowing when and how things should be done and doing them justly. He's a kind man, as all who know him can and do attest frequently. He is a laborer without equal, a laborer with exceptional dignity of both pace and purpose, but he knows when to laugh, and he often does. And he's a leader in thought and action, working to preserve <clears throat> the best of our heritage and our tradition, and making them available in generous bundles to our nation's youth. He is the president of our university, and no one has carried the responsibility of leadership with more tender care and concern. He is liberal enough to seek and champion change, but logical in assuring that the change he champions is to do something better and not merely to do something new. He's loyal to family, to friends, to state and nation and to this college height on hilltop fair with beauty all its own. He is modest, so modest in fact that I would be fearful of embarrassing him by continuing this alphabetical litany if what I am saying, if what I am saying were not completely true as it is and were not representative of his real reputation as it is. He's a good neighbor the kind of man that everyone would like to have next door, in the next block, or in the role of president of their university. Dero is an optimist, and his optimism is infectious and inspiring. D. Gibson tells me that Dero deliberately scheduled Duke for the opening game of this year's basketball season. <laughs> <laughs> and while he is patient, he is not a pessimist. Unless, of course, one subscribes to the proposition that a, a pessimist who is one who looks both ways when he crosses a one-way street. And I'm of the opinion that D. Rowe Downing would do just that because he's a prudent man. And he's a powerful man, as we want the president of our university to be. But he has never been known to abuse power nor flaunt it. He's a questioning man, and we can be proud of the tenor of his persistent questions. Is it right or wrong? Is it true or false? Is it helpful or hurtful? Is it the best for Western? Dio is a responsible, religious, and righteous man. He sees his duty clearly. He does it by a strict but tolerant moral code and he is aflame with a spirit of righteousness for his fellow man. He is not a rich man, for he is the president of our university. He is sincere and successful, but he recognizes that success is not an absolute state, and he is sincere in not being satisfied to rest on past successes. And certainly success has not spoiled this man. He is a teacher in the finest sense of the word. He is thoughtful, truthful, and tolerant. And by William Arthur Ward's definition, D. Rowe Downing is a great teacher. For as Ward describes it, the mediocre teacher tells. The good teacher explains. The superior teacher demonstrates. The great teacher inspires. D. Rowe is a great teacher, and he's a universal man, or in modern parlance, he's truly a man for all seasons. He's a virtuous man <clears throat> who not only abstains from vice, but has no apparent affection for it. He's a worldly man who recognizes that one must often subordinate lesser objectives to the attainment of more important objectives. And he is a wise man, for he knows which are the subordinate objectives and which are the more important objectives. He is a wealthy man, not because of worldly goods, for he is the president of our university, 
but because of the family who surrounds him tonight and the esteem in which he is held by his fellow men. Certainly he is not, in modern slang, an X-rated man. For D. Rowe Downing's qualities have been so generously given to all of us that there is no limitation to those to whom his inspiration has reached. We have all shared in this grand general purpose G-rated giant. He's a youthful man whose obvious verve, personal vigor, vitality of his life for friends, for loved ones, and for his beloved Western have abounded since first I saw him in high school, later on on College Heights, and in the big red basketball uniform, and finally in the president's chair. His zeal for life and for living and serving is equaled only by the gratitude, the respect, and the affection that we have for this extraordinary friend. This is certainly not the alpha and omega of this giant, this great and good man. It's merely as simple A, B, C through X, Y, Z of D. Rowe Downing as seen by a lifelong friend, a fellow Kentuckian, and a very proud Western classmate of the president of our university. De Tocqueville also said that America is great because America is good. And when America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. With men and women like D. Rowe and Harriet Downing in our midst, inspiring our youth and setting the high standards of goodness and grace for all to emulate, the greatness of our nation is assured. So tonight we are so fortunate, D. Rowe, Harriet, to be your friends. So grateful for this opportunity to express to you the depth of our appreciation, our affection, and yes, our love. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. That was very well said. Our second distinguished individual on our program tonight is Mr. Julian Goodman. Mr. Goodman has many, many accomplishments in the field of journalism and broadcast media. He is also a native of Glasgow, a Western Kentucky University graduate. After World War II, he started up the ladder with the National Broadcasting Company and served many important spots with that company. He became president, later chairman of the board and chief executive officer of NBC. And he serves today as chairman of the executive committee of this broadcasting giant. His personal credentials that bring him here to our meeting tonight are his roots in Glasgow and the Good Goodman family. And we felt it particularly appropriate that he speak on this program. It is my pleasure to present Mr. Julian Goodman. Mr. Goodman. Thank you very much, Herb. Dero, Harriet, you can relax, Dero, because Russ has said everything so well. I'm not going to say all those nice things about you. I'm not even going to tell about the time your mother, as you came out on the basketball floor resplendent in your all-American uniform, your mother leaped to the floor and said, upon my soul, he's the prettiest boy in the world. <laughs> <clears throat> but I am especially pleased to be here tonight to speak as a representative of this fine family. I would have come anyway, but I'm gratified to be asked to speak because I never did finish my final examination in public speaking at Western. Through no fault of my own, it was scheduled for 37 years ago last week, which turned out to be the Monday after Pearl Harbor Day. It was supposed to be an extemporaneous speech, and I promise not to deliver, deliver that one to you tonight. But what I am here to say, uh, and one of the family failings that we all have in, in our family, 
is that we just don't have the ability to say things that we don't mean. What I am here to say is that I am particularly proud to be a member of the same family as Dero Downing. And let me tell you just a little bit about that family, if you'll hold still for it. Our first ancestor came over here from England and fought in the Revolutionary War, rising to the rank of private and presumably working for our side. <laughs> there is a little argument about that rank because my sister-in-law, Jane Goodman, says he was a lieutenant in the Revolutionary Navy. <laughs> and my, my brother, Charlie, says she's crazy that there was no Revolutionary <laughs> Navy, but I think Jane is uh, undoubtedly right. But it was uh, his son, this Revolutionary fighter's son, Jacob Goodman, whom we all regard with so much awe. Uh, the man who has been our inspiration and who has been responsible for lighting the fuse that ignited the Goodman Downing population explosion. <laughs> Uncle Jake, as he was fondly called, sired 32 children. <laughs> 14 by his first wife and 18 by his second. There were no twins. <laughs> he fathered his last child at the age of 78. But you do have to remember that there was no television to watch back then. <laughs> well, and an uncounted number of begats later after that, Uncle Dudley Goodman sired eight fine children and among them, Dero's mother and my father. And also among them were some of the fine people, some of the loveliest and most devoted families in the world, and many of them represented here tonight at this Goodman table. And incidentally, I forgot to stand up when they introduced all the Goodmans. That's why they didn't, <laughs> didn't count all of them. But an early description of this family calls them multitudinous, and filled with a great love of family. And nobody typified these particular qualities more than Dero's mother, Burton Downing, Mrs. Aldridge Downing. She had an inquisitive mind, Russ Darty said that Dero had. So did she. She had an interest in all things, great and small. She had a heart full of love for everybody who needed it and some who didn't need it. And she had the strength to carry through the iron determination that she had, qualities which are all evident also in Dero. It's a little difficult to talk about Dero's part of the family without talking about all the rest of them. And with your kind permission, which I have already sought from my brothers who have heard it so frequently they may leave, with your kind permission, let me tell one story about my father which is illustrative of the kind of character which runs through the rest of the family. He was proud of all of his family, three of us boys, but he was careful not to be more proud of one than the other. And on a day in 1966, I called him and I said, Pop, since I could hardly have done this without you, I want you to know that this company, the National Broadcasting Company, apparently being of sound mind, has seen fit to elect me its president. And as I say, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, and I would like to thank you, and wanted you to know about it first. And he said, son, I am proud of you. I really don't, please don't think that if I have to hang up, that it takes away anything from how proud I am of what you've done. But he said there is a mule sale downtown. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, they only have those once every three weeks. <laughs> Later, he saw somebody down at the social center of Glasgow, the post office, and he said, you know, I really didn't need another mule, but I just didn't want Jillian to feel uppity. <laughs> Well, there was no chance that coming from the kind of family that Dero and I have come from, that either of us could in any way feel uppity. 
When I was growing up in Glasgow, it was not only fashionable to read the Bible, but everybody did it, and most of us enjoyed and benefited from it. And I remember reading it very well, and I remember a phrase that stuck in my mind then, and one that I have tried to live by since, and one that I remember still. It comes from Romans 12, and these are not the exact words because there are so many translations. But the sense of it is, don't think too highly of yourselves. For as we uh, have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, with differing gifts, and we must use them each according to their worth, and do with them what we can. Nobody, it seems to me, has better exemplified the spirit of those words than Dero. And no one has lived through so many difficult situations with such unwavering high principles. I say this not just as a representative of the family you see here tonight, but as an observer of some of the things that go on in the world around us. I know of no person in public life who has won such unqualified respect, such unqualified esteem and admiration from all with whom he has come in contact, as has Dero Downing, and from many people he has never met. Russ Darty has already underscored that. Dero and I and Russ were in school together a long time ago here at Western, and each one of us went our different ways, sometimes traveling too fast and too far. But it is a particular pleasure for me to be here tonight with them, as well as, as with all of you. During some of the travels that I've talked about, I saw something that reminded me at the time of Dero, and I, I'm glad to have an opportunity to express it to you here tonight. It reminded me of him in a way, that is, because there is, I hope, no air of finality here tonight, but rather we're talking about the future. But as a sightseer, Betty and I went to see, during the Queen's Jubilee in England, the great St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the great structures in the world, completed about 1711 by the astronomer and mathematician who, uh, geometrist, I guess, uh, who was more famous as the architect of this magnificent cathedral, Sir Christopher Wren. And as we walked through this building, the statues of the, it's filled with so much English history and, and filled really with the statues of so many famous men throughout history. Lord Nelson was one, the Duke of Wellington, Samuel Johnson lies there, and many other famous people in the history of the world. But there's only a very small inscription down at the bottom of this enormous cathedral for the man who built it and who made it so beautiful. And that inscription for Sir Christopher Wren is in Latin, which was not my best subject in school. So I had the guide translate it for me. And this small inscription of this great architect, architect says, if you would look for his monument, look around you. This cathedral is his work and his monument. And not that Dero needs a monument, and not that a university is a cathedral, but what better testimony can a man have than to have affected for the better the lives of so many people who have passed through this university, people who will in their turn affect for the better other people they will come in contact with. 
So Nero, from all of us here, our personal affection and our pride in your many accomplishments. And if you need to look for your monument, look around you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. It is now my pleasure to introduce one of our local citizens that we all hold in very high esteem. And it'll be his pleasure to make the main introduction of the evening. Buddy Pearson. Buddy. Herb, D. Rowe, Harriet, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. This is D-Roll Downing Day by proclamation. And I've been asked to read this proclamation to you and to present it to D-Roll. It's beautifully framed. And it says, whereas Dr. D-Roll G. Downing has been connected with the Western spirit continuously since he entered Western in September 1939, and was graduated with the A.B. degree, majoring in mathematics in June 1943. <coughs> Immediately following graduation, a brief interim in the Uni United States Navy was necessary, and then he returned to Western as a mathematics teacher, a basketball coach at, at College High School, a division of Western's training school. And whereas Dr. Downing then began his rise in academic responsibilities, by occupying a number of positions and becoming Vice President of Business Affairs in 1962. And in 1969, just three years after Western achieved university status, was chosen as Western's fourth president. And whereas under appointment of the Board of Regents, President Downing acts as the university chief executive officer, carrying out the policies approved by the board and providing leadership to the university community and during the years has been recipient of numerous coveted awards. And whereas D. Rowe, affectionately referred to by all who know him, watched Western Kentucky University grow to an enrollment of over 13,000 students during his years of service. And this growth has been most beneficial to the growth in the economy of Bowling Green and Warren County. Now, therefore, it is deemed of utmost importance to pay special tribute to a person who has been so instrumental in the progress of our city and our county and the undersigned as voice and representatives of all the people of this area hereby declare the significance of setting aside the 14th day of December 1978 to be and is designated as D. Rowe Downing Day. It's signed by Basil W. Griffin, Judge Executive of Warren County, B.L. Steen, Mayor of the City of Bowling Green, and Ralph Buchanan, President of the Bowling Green Warren County Chamber of Commerce. D. Rowe, I present this to you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce our principal honoree this evening, or co-honoree. I think we're all agreed that Western has been most blessed in the men who have served as presidents of this hallowed institution over the years. But it has also been blessed by the first ladies who have accompanied these presidents. And it would be remiss, I think, on my part, if I did not say what was in all of your hearts. And that is, of all the first ladies that this university has known, no one has brought more warmth and grace and charm to the university than Harriet Downing. Harriet. <laughs> 